The Epilepsy Foundation is pleased to share with you an educational advocacy webinar on cannabis, cannabidiol, hemp, and the 2018 Farm Bill. The mission of the Epilepsy Foundation is to lead the fight to overcome the challenges of living with epilepsy and to accelerate therapies to stop seizures, find cures, and save lives. My name is Dr. Elaine Kiriakopoulos, and I would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone who has joined us this evening. It is wonderful to have you with us as we begin a new year of learning together. I am so very pleased to be able to introduce everyone to our guest speakers and the leaders of our advocacy team at the Epilepsy Foundation. As the Epilepsy Foundation's Vice President of Government Relations and Advocacy, Laura Widener leads the Foundation's strategy to advance public policy that improves the lives of people affected by epilepsy and drives towards a cure at the federal and state levels. She joined the Foundation last September after nine years with the National Multiple Sclerosis Society's Government Relations Team in DC. Welcome, Laura. Abby Raudabush is the Epilepsy Foundation's Government Relations Manager, working on a range of issues impacting the epilepsy community, like funding for epilepsy programs and ensuring access to health care, including for medical cannabis. Before starting at the Foundation, Abby advocated with a focus on health policy at the state level in New York. Welcome, Abby. Thank you both for sharing your time and expertise with us this evening. I'd like to review with you the format for tonight's webinar. During the speaker presentations, all phone lines will be muted. We would like to encourage everyone to submit their questions at any time during the webinar. To do so, type your questions into the question window on the GoToWebinar panel and click Send. We will read your questions aloud during the question and answer portion of the webinar. Please keep your questions general in nature as the webinar is intended for educational purposes. This webinar does not take the place of individual medical or legal advice. This webinar will be recorded and available for viewing and listening on epilepsy.com. The Epilepsy Foundation is working to provide information and education that serves the spectrum of individuals and families impacted by epilepsy. Often, when you have a question about your health or your loved one's health, you may hear or read things that you are not sure how to interpret. The Foundation's webinar education series aims to bring together experts who can share with you up-to-date and accurate information to help answer your questions. We will start tonight's webinar with a review of some of the key language or terms that are commonly used when people speak about marijuana and epilepsy and the issues surrounding its use. <clears throat> Beginning with marijuana, also referred to as cannabis, the marijuana plant's formal name is cannabis sativa. Similar to any plant, it contains many different compounds. The cannabis plant is known to contain over 500 different compounds. Tonight's discussion will include reference to some of the compounds which arise from cannabis. When people use the words marijuana or cannabis, this refers to the dried flowers and leaves of the cannabis plant. Some examples of street terms you may have heard used for cannabis include weed, pot, or dope. Cannabis has over a hundred compounds that are known as cannabinoids. This is important to understand because these different compounds are what produces an effect on the brain and the nervous system as well as other organs in the body. Cannabis contains both mind-altering, 
also called psychoactive compounds, as well as compounds that are not mind-altering. When the term cannabis is used, it can be in reference to whole plant marijuana or chemicals in the marijuana plant that are used for medicinal purposes. Next, we will move on to the term medical marijuana or medical cannabis. We know that marijuana has chemicals that might help to improve symptoms for some health problems in some people. There is no chemical difference between cannabis and medical cannabis. However, medical cannabis must be obtained at a dispensary and must comply with testing and safety requirements. Another term to be familiar with is cannabinoids. Cannabinoids are substances or chemicals that are found in marijuana that can be extracted from the plant and have the ability to impact how cells in the body and brain function. The two main cannabinoids found in marijuana are tetrahydrocannabinol, or otherwise known as THC, and cannabidiol, otherwise known as CBD. Ongoing research will help to determine exactly how cannabinoids work to affect the brain and how a cannabinoid like CDB, CBD works to decrease seizure activity. The exact way CBD produces anti-seizure effects is unknown, but scientists believe that, believe that CBD affects brain cells to stop seizures in more than one way. The reality is that at this time, we simply don't know, but it is an exciting area of scientific research being monitored carefully by many going forward. Let's take a moment to review the term hemp, which has been front and center in the news in recent weeks. Hemp is a variety of the cannabis sativa L plant that has historically grown for fibrous materials found in its stalks and seeds. Traditionally, it has been used to make items such as clothing, fiber, upholstery, and other household goods. Hemp contains the cannabinoids we just reviewed, THC and CBD. It is important to know, because of our discussion to follow around hemp and the Farm Bill, that the Food and Drug Administration considers all CBD, even CBD derived from hemp, a drug and categorizes it as illegal to be put in foods and or health products without FDA approval. Next is cannabidiol, also referred to as CBD or cannabidiol oil and carrying the brand name Epidiolex. CBD or Epidiolex brand name is a seizure medication that is prescribed by a physician. It is a plant-based formulation of CBD that is prescribed as an oral solution. The FDA approved CBD brand name Epidiolex on June 25, 2018 to treat seizures in people who are two years of age and older with a diagnosis of Dravet syndrome or Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. Epidiolex is a pharmaceutical grade version of CBD oil and is assured to have a uniform strength and consistent delivery. Like all other medications, this medication carries with it a risk for side effects. It may need dose adjustments and potentially there can be a need for adjustment of other seizure medications as well. This means that all treatment and adjustments should be made with the advice and, guid and, and guidance of your doctor. This medication brings a new treatment option for select groups of patients with Lennox-Gastaut syndrome and Dravet syndrome. At this time, I would like to turn things over to our advocacy team who will provide us with background on federal and state cannabis laws, the 2018 Farm Bill and its legal implications, and also share with us what the changes mean for people living with epilepsy. Laura, thank you for guiding us. Great, thank you so much. 
So if we can move to the next slide, I wanted to start by reminding everyone what the law was before the Farm Bill was enacted. So on the next slide, you'll see that at the federal level, it was Schedule I under the Controlled Substances Act. That means that the Drug Enforcement Administration had deemed that there was no medical value and a high potential for abuse. The federal definition of hemp was limited to stalk, seeds, and fibers of the plant, and everything else, including cannabinoids, derivatives, tinctures, were classified as cannabis. There was an outright prohibition on cannabis, uh, although you could grow hemp with a federal license. On the next slide, let's talk about at the state level. So there were three classifications, basically. CBD only, medicinal. Second, there was full medicinal cannabis. And third, recreational for adults. In all cases, cannabis had, has to be grown, manufactured, and distributed within the state, and there was no outside cannabis allowed. Federal law still applied, and the safety and security mechanisms differed from state to state. There are no uniform dosing, labeling, or lab testing requirements, and it's important to note that the quality and potency can change depending on the brand, batch, or type of plant used. On the next slide, we have a map of the country that shows the three categories I was just talking about. So green uh, is recreational cannabis being legal. Yellow is medical cannabis being legal. And blue is CBD only medicinal being legal. Gr the gray states, um, there is no legal use. So you can take a look at this map um, and see what the situ situation is for your particular state. If we move to the next slide, I'll now talk about what it means now that the federal farm bill has been signed into law. So in the next slide, the farm bill basically does two things. One, it changes the federal definition of hemp, and we've included it here on the slide. So the federal definition is now cannabis sativa plant, derivatives, cannabinoids, and tinctures with less than 0 0.3 THC by dry weight. Second, the farm bill exempts hemp from the Controlled Substances Act. So on the next slide, I'll explain what this means. Cannabis with less than 0 0.3 THC is now considered hemp and is legalized. It's no longer Schedule I. The commercial and industrial cultivation of hemp is now allowed, as well as transfer across state lines. There are no federal restrictions on the cultivation, manufacture, sale, and possession of hemp and its derivatives, including CBD. However, we want to very strongly emphasize that this does not mean that it's a free-for-all with no restrictions. And with that, I'll turn it over to Abby to start talking about what some of those restrictions are under federal law now. Thank you, Laura. Um, so as Laura said, this is um, definitely not a free-for-all. You, um, you aren't free to do whatever you want as long as um, it's a hemp plant. First, a product or plant with more than 0.3% THC is still considered cannabis under federal law and it still remains schedule one. So the important thing here is the amount of THC that is in both the plant and any product you get, which uh, would include CBD oil. It must contain 0.3% THC or less to be legal on the federal level. Regulations for hemp, such as who is allowed to grow it, what kind of licenses they have to get, any testing requirements, um, lab requirements, things like that, those regulations will be left to the states. The states must come up with their plan and have it approved by the federal government. Uh, if states opt out of regulations and decide not to write them um, themselves, then the federal government will step in and institute a federally run program in that state. Under this bill, personal growth 
is not allowed. Um, and again, who is allowed to grow it, where they can grow it, how they have to grow it, all of that will be dictated by the regulations that the states write. So the farm bill was just passed uh, in at the end of December and regulations have not come out yet, but they will come out soon. So we're kind of in an area right now um, where it is legal, but nobody can start growing until we get these parameters and understand um, the legal area they have to work in. CBD is only legal if it is derived from hemp plants in compliance with the farm bill. So it's only legal if it was grown by someone who has a valid license in the state and follows all of the regulations. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, the Farm Bill does not impact state medical cannabis programs. So you um, just because CBD and hemp are legal now does not mean that anyone can walk in to a medical dispensary and purchase it. Uh, you still have to follow the rules in the states and most states with medical dispensaries require you to be a registered medical cannabis patient and to have a registration card that you present at the dispensary, none of that will change, including getting a recommendation for your doctor and actually getting the patient card. Again, while CBD is legal, it is not a free-for-all. Um, there will be restrictions that I just talked about and other parameters in place. Um, State medical cannabis and CBD laws must be followed. Um, and that includes who is eligible to get it, the dispensaries that I just talked about, and then CBD sold within the state uh, at medical cannabis dispensaries will still have to comply with the testing and labeling requirements as well as limits on um, any other cannabinoids or substances used. Next slide, please. So there are other considerations also. Uh, we're saying it's not a free-for-all legally, but it is also not a miracle drug. It is important to understand that this should be treated like a medication, just like any other medication that you would take. And so with that, you should be consulting with your physician and considering a number of other things. Next slide, please. So the first thing um, to know is that states are free to enact stricter regulations than the federal government, which is similar to um, alcohol or tobacco laws. In some states, uh, they are raising the age uh, for you to be allowed to purchase tobacco. Um, in states, they limit when you can purchase alcohol, uh, things like that. So that is allowed. They can get stricter. And for states that already have existing CBD laws, if their state, if the state law says, for example, that CBD is legal in the state if it has 0.6% THC or less, that would be legal on the state level, but that CBD would not be federally legal. So there are two different aspects that you have to look at it from. It must be legal through your state. Uh, but also this federal definition of hemp. There is still only one FDA-approved CBD product for ep epilepsy that is specifically indicated for seizures associated with Dravet and LGS in people two plus years or older. So with this, it's important to understand that not all CBD is the same. Next slide, please. There are sort of three different buckets of CBD, and it's important to understand the differences between the three. First, there's medical grade. So this would be brand name Epidiolex that goes through the FDA clinical trial and approval process and must comply with pharmaceutical regulations. This means that the product is consistent from batch to batch and also follows all the FDA regulations for uh, how they 
uh, produce it, ship it, all of that. Then there's dispensary grade, which is sort of a step down. This CBD must follow state medical cannabis laws, which include uh, where they can grow it, who can grow it, manufacturing, how they make the product, where they test it, what they test it for, what is on the label. So there are more guidelines and safety mechanisms set up for this. However, it is important to note that even with dispensary grade CBD, you aren't always getting the same thing, uh, or there's a possibility that you're not always getting the same thing from batch to batch, even if you buy the same brand every time, because it, there aren't as strict regulations around it. And there is commercial grade CBD, which has few enforced regulations governing the manufacturing, testing, labeling, requirements, um, as well as any medical claims that they make. So any medical claims made with medical grade CBD must be evidence-based and it must be shown through the clinical trial process, whereas with commercial grade, sometimes they make medical claims with no scientific backing behind it. There are no um, studies specific to their product to prove what they're saying. Um, this can vary widely from batch to batch, and in some cases when it has been tested has actually been shown to include no CBD at all, even though the label claims that it was a CBD oil. So this leads to it being less reliable from batch to batch. There have also been a series of FDA warning letters because these are ingestibles. The FDA does have jurisdiction over commercial grade CBD. And so from time to time, the FDA tests some of these products. And based on what they find, they um, have sent warning letters to some companies in the past because, as I mentioned, maybe they didn't have the amount of CBD that they claimed or they were making medical claims without any backing. So it is important to know the differences between the three grades when we're talking about CBD because a commercial grade CBD product is very much not the same um, as far as consistency um, and safeguards as medical grade. Next slide, please. And um, at this time, I would like to turn things back over to Dr. Kira, sorry, Kira Kopoulos to provide guidance on the importance of physician-directed care and to share with everyone additional Epilepsy Foundation resources for learning more about this topic. Thank you, Abby. <clears throat> So um, consulting with your physician about a new therapy, be it a medication, a supplement, or a procedure, is vital to helping you make the best decisions around treating your epilepsy. This includes CBD. So clinical research studies have demonstrated that CBD is not free from risk for side effects or drug interactions. It is also very important to remember you should never independently change your treatment plan without consulting your physician or nurse. This includes starting or stopping medications, adjusting medication doses, or changing the time of day or evening when you take your medication. It is always best and safest to speak with your epilepsy doctor or epilepsy nurse specialist before making any changes whatsoever. Your physician can review with you any new therapy you may want to consider, and just as with any discussion about a treatment plan to control your seizures, having a complete understanding of the new therapy or supplement um, or medication, its indications, its contraindications, which means for some people they shouldn't take it at all, its risks and benefits, will help lead you to making the best decisions with your doctor's advice. There are a number of resources you can use to learn more about CBD and epilepsy. As we just discussed, speaking with your physician or nurse is a good place to start. 
You can also find information for reading on epilepsy.com and by calling into the Epilepsy Foundation's 24-7 helpline. In addition, your local Epilepsy Foundation office can help to provide you with information, resources, and support and can also help to direct you to an epilepsy center close to your home where you will find medical providers who specialize in the diagnosis and treatment of epilepsy. To learn more about Epilepsy Foundation advocacy efforts, you can visit advocacy.epilepsy.com online where you will find additional resources on medical cannabis and frequently asked questions surrounding advocacy. In addition, we invite you to join the Epilepsy Foundation Speak Up, Speak Out Advocacy Network. You can also contact your local Epilepsy Foundation office who can assist you with advocacy resources and who would welcome your participation in epilepsy advocacy efforts in your home state. I would like to take a moment to thank Laura Widener and Abby Rauderbush for providing our epilepsy community with this important advocacy overview and update. I would also like to thank each of you for joining us and hope you will join us throughout 2019 as we aim to provide you with learning opportunities that help to answer your questions and guide you to the resources you need to manage your epilepsy well. This ends the presentation portion of our webinar, and we will now be moving on to the question and answer portion of the webinar.